Diane Francis is an award-winning columnist. He's, she's the editor at large at the National Post. She's also a fellow at the Atlantic Institute or Council in Washington, and she's an award-winning author. Um, Diane, welcome. Thank you. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. Diane, I'm delighted to have you today as we talk about many things from the state of Canada to the world. And uh, one of the things I'd like to start off with is the, is the state of Canada. Um, I know that you've written extensively about it. Um, we, we know that there's a lot of challenges that Canada faces. What would you summarize as the state of Canada today? Well, I think that it's a, a, a you know, it's a, it's a vibrant economy, a uh, very nice society uh, that does okay, uh, even though it's being run by a coalition of people that don't know anything about governance, business, economics, geopolitics, defense, security, anything. Uh, we have wow. two leaders in tandem who've made a deal that they didn't tell the voters in the last election that they were going to do, and they stay there till 2025 if they choose to. And uh, neither one of them, one got 15% of the popular vote, the other one 30. So mm -hmm. Canada's stuck with a kind of a, I think, a, a inadequate democratic system in terms of how, how the voting can come out. Uh, and, you know, we have very mediocre management. Okay, so that's the punchline. We've got a wonderful country, but managed by a coalition, and it's very mediocre. That's it, is it? Yep, in a nutshell. Okay, okay so in that context, um, we're, I mean, obviously I'm with the Frontier Center for Public Policy, so we're used to a, a world, uh, dare we say, Diane, where we try to look at the pros and cons of an issue. We try to govern or recommend policy that's based on good sound evidence and facts and analysis. So what the heck is our country being governed then by? Well, it's being governed by a prime minister who has this coalition with an NDP leader who's a socialist. Uh, and basically, uh, he's uh, been enacting a very um, Davosian, if you like, uh, to use that phrase. I went to Davos 25 times. It was a great place to go to learn stuff. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but I didn't agree with uh, a lot of what they ended up uh, supporting. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, he and his, uh, his uh, team have swallowed whole the Greenpeace agenda, the Davos agenda, the woke agenda, you know, and this is what they do. And, you know, okay. irrespective of, and also have concocted some arbitrary policies, notably the flood of immigration they're allowing in every year that has mm -hmm. gone on since 2015, that is now demonstrably, it's a million people a year, 500,000 immigrants and at least 500,000 foreign students. And the way I like to put it to Canadians is that that's a million people a year who get a health card and are breaking our health care system and a million people a year who need somewhere to rent or live, which is wow. up prices. And the most important thing is the vast majority of those million go to Toronto and Vancouver. They don't go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. really yeah, so we, we in a million, that's that's record in we, terms of the history record, of our country. Record, and it was based on our arbitrary idea that uh, this prime minister, Bill Morneau, his ex-finance uh, minister who g bounced out for scandal, uh, and uh, Dominic Barton, who is the head of McKinsey, has been for years and mm -hmm. has gotten into all kinds of trouble with McKinsey and was our ambassador in China, a bad one. And these guys sat down, uh, Mark Wise, who's now running a, a big pension fund, they sat down at a Muskoka cottage and decided that Canada should have 100 million people by the year 2100. Sort of damn the per per torpedoes. Let's give away a million health cards a year, which they don't think of it in those terms because it's a provincial matter. And so that, that's what is, is, is uh, uh, 
discombobulating this country to a great extent in the two biggest cities in this country. Yeah, no, it's a very powerful summation. So if we could uh, just dive into this a little bit more then, um, it seems to me like when you say a Davos, Davosonian approach to governance, what, what do you mean by that exactly? So people understand that. Well, I mean, I, I believe it's a, it's a, uh, you know, a, uh, a green agenda mm -hmm. uh, based on NGOs that aren't elected by anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a, a uh, S -E -G -E -S -G agenda from Davos by a bunch of guys who get involved there and aren't elected by anybody. As per your, your comments about immigration, um, a million people coming in every year is, is a huge number of people um, that uh, places a, a burden on the existing ones. I mean, there's there's pros and cons, obviously, but that's a that's a record number. Yeah, it's the highest proportion of any G7 nation, and it's just a disproportionate to our economic growth uh, trajectory. And mm -hmm. it, it's just to clarify, it's a million, it's half a million uh, landed permanent immigrants, and half a million students, many of whom come on bogus for bogus reasons and never leave again then eventually apply to stay permanently. Each of them require a health card, which is why it takes months for people to get an appointment now in Toronto or Vancouver for a specialist to look at your mole on your cheek, for goodness sake. The system is close to breaking, and they're breaking it. So I want to look at uh, some of the, the more detailed um, points around our economy. If we look at gas prices, uh, we know that... Um, Inflation stats just came out for July. I think we're up at around three and a half percent. We've got a national debt, if memory serves me correctly. At it's hard to keep these figures straight. At one point one trillion dollars, um, we've got record deficits federally and uh, in different provinces. Where's the state of our economy? Because you said it's it's chugging along nicely, but aren't there aren't those ominous clouds? No, I don't think there's anything terribly ominous in that. Uh, Basically, look, to be blunt, Canada is an autonomous economic region of the United States. That's what it is. Our trade is intercorporate transfers. We call it trade. We do not. We have, we have great companies. We make good products. We do good services. But at the end of the day, it's up to the Americans and their economy, and we go up and down with them with very little di divergence. And we just don't have a uh, entrepreneurial culture of traders. We don't do that. Our idea of trade is to sell something to the Yanks. And so that's mm -hmm. great. It's a great living. Uh, the, other, the other problem, which leads into another problem. So what I'm saying is that the, the one exception to the, the fact that we flow with them is that we have a government that's actually uh, putting us faster in debt uh, than, than the Americans are. They're not doing a great job either, but the Canada mm -hmm. is just, you know, in a class by itself. So we have the highest consumer debt in the world. Highest consumer debt. That's not because we charge things in our credit card. That's because we've been bringing in a million people a year to jam up the housing prices in the two biggest cities. And so house prices have doubled. And in some cases, rents have doubled or tripled. So that's wow. where people are getting into debt. They just don't have money. So they're getting, they're buying a house and they're getting into huge mortgages. And that's mm -hmm. the underlying cause behind this. This is just a poorly managed federal government who don't have a clue. Now, that also flows into another pet peeve of mine, and that is Canada is now embarrassing itself internationally, this government, because we're mm -hmm. not pulling our weight in NATO. We're not pulling our weight in NORAD. So, Diane, you're you're giving us reality therapy that when we look at our economy, we we really are kind of a branch plant of yeah. the United States, and uh, we're not pulling our weight internationally. So the the case in point is NATO. Uh, so we what's the proof of that? We aren't just meeting our GDP percentage allocation towards NATO. Yeah. Every member needs to do what is it two percent? Two percent. We committed. This guy committed Trudeau. In 2015, yeah, 2% will make it. And last year he told the Washington Post, we'll never get there. And we're like at 1-1. I mean, it's, it's pretty disgraceful. The bottom line is that we are 
made secure. We don't have anybody in the Arctic. We have more coastline than any other nation on the planet. Okay, mm -hmm. and we have a, we have we have the navy smaller than Sri Lanka's. We have you no military. They can't recruit people. Nobody wants to work for them. They have been absolutely hollowing out our military. Okay, which is fine. Why, so what is your theory? Why do you well, think, I think again? I think again, it's this this uh, this sort of agenda uh, of uh, this this sort of Euro Davos agenda of you know war is a dirty word. We can't ever we can't have guns. We can't do that kind of thing. And and mm -hmm. you know we're, we're we're relying on Big Brother to the south to guard all of our coastlines, our airspace. And, and that sort of thing. And that's great. But one day they're going to start giving us an invoice. Wow. So, I, I mean, I think that your points about Northern sovereignty are well taken. I mean, if you compare and contrast between, say, how the U.S. has developed Alaska versus, say, the Canadian North, it's pretty stunning difference, isn't it? Well, there you go. Again, this is this uh, Canada. Canada is a different uh, culture anyway. I mean, Canadians are... Uh, less entrepreneurial uh, by nature uh, and a little more defer, de defer, they pay more deference to governments. They, let gov they, they sort of trust their governments to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have is a, and again, this is Trudeau's uh, problem and it's the religion in, in Quebec and in Ottawa, which is run by Quebec. And that is that, you know, uh, nuclear is bad um, mm -hmm. Military is bad. We're pacifist, and the environment is all important. And that that's that's not that's that's fine as a value system, but that's not what you you uh, you uh, make government policy without getting a consensus on that. Exactly. So when we look at um, the situation, though, financially, our I mean, this last this whole summer interest rates keep creeping up um, with bonds. So is, is our government cornering themselves where we'll get into that uh, situation where because of higher interest rates, we'll have ballooning deficits and that we're, that's a real problem for Canada. Look, we have two trust fund kids, Singh and Trudeau. Okay. Little rich boys. Mm -hmm. Never really ran a business or met a payroll in their lives. Yeah, they've never run anything in their lives. Yeah, just putting it on daddy's tab. That's right. what they're doing to us, and we're daddy. We're the daddy, mm -hmm. and so they're putting it on the tab. Deficits are growing. You get the finance minister who's a journalist. She doesn't have any credentials to be a finance minister, mm -hmm. okay, or even a bookkeeper, and she gets on there saying everything's just fine. It's fine. We're doing yeah. real well. Well, you know what? That's 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 the little talk amongst themselves that they give you the little pep talks internally and, mm -hmm. and I just don't buy it and and I don't think the world buys it so you know Canada cannot can, the, and Canada continues to do okay because in spite of bad government mm -hmm. you know we've got a great resource base and anybody who denies that we're not based on resources uh, yeah. is living on another planet exactly. and they've also attacked that and they've disrespected Western Canada Mm -hmm. And, you know, a whole host of other things. I mean, they're just an elitist bunch of pretenders. And by mm -hmm. the way, this is another statistic that really bothers everybody. Not only are they forcing provinces to give away a million health care cards a year that mm -hmm. we can't afford to give away, but this government is spending $17.7 billion, the federal government of Trudeau, $17.7 billion dollars on hiring management consultants because they don't know anything. They don't know what to do. It's it's mm -hmm. a huge expenditure. And by the way, it's nearly half our defense budget. So they're spending wow. nearly half our defense budget to hire guys who tell them what to do because they don't know. So where's the, where's the civil service in, in this great tradition in Canada? Have they all gone AWOL? Uh, no, they, they've hired more civil servants in the time they've been in power uh, and proportionally than any other government in recent history. So we got a flood of civil servants. We got a flood of management consultants running around mm -hmm. because, you know, his, his cabinet doesn't know what they're doing. Another mm -hmm. factoid, he just uh, made cabinet changes. 
There's not one cabinet minister who has domain expertise in their portfolio. Not one. Number two, 39. Okay, 39. The United States has 25 in its cabinet. Britain has 22. And Australia, which is a much better run country than Canada, 20. We have 39. They get double the income. They get a car and a driver. They get all kinds of perks. They get publicists. I mean, this is, this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, it's beyond mediocre uh, government. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's interesting you mentioned that about uh, the dynamic of ministers being more public faces or symbols of their minist ministry rather than having any domain or managerial expertise of their area. I think that's that's a great insight. Most of them are environmental activists and political operatives. And that's what's running a G7 economy. I think that's pretty terrible. So one of the keys to, uh, as you know so well, Diane, is, is foundation uh, productivity. Uh, that is foundational to not only our economy, but really our quality of life, the choices that we can make in terms of what we're going to do. So talk, tell us more about Canada's uh, productivity uh, track record the last few years. I, I think we lag. We always have ever since I've been yeah. to Canada. We've lagged. We've lagged the U.S., well, I, I think for me, the, the, the bottom line is that if you look at the last 11 quarters, if memory serves me correctly, I believe eight, maybe even nine have declined in terms of productivity. Well, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. We're bringing in a million people who could be parking lot attendants. We're not bringing, we also have a skills yeah. worker shortage with the highest immigration rates on the planet. We also didn't stop bringing in immigration at that level during covid the Australians mm -hmm. shut down their immigration. So did New Zealand. So did countries that understand how to run themselves. So would you say Australia would be a good model that we could we uh, look to? It puts us to shame. Every and why do you say that? Every metric, uh, uh, every metric, productivity, um, economic uh, GDP per capita, um, quality of life's the same. It's a social democracy. You can't use the excuse, well, you know, they don't look after mm -hmm. people. No, they have as good, if not better, health care and other benefits as Canada does. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have, uh, their FDI is growing, not falling as ours is. Mm -hmm. uh, their taxation rate is lower. Their uh, death rate is, uh, their, uh, what should I say, their lifespans are longer. That's right. Yeah. Because they have better weather. But but what I'm saying is that this is a, a beautifully run country. And it they, really is. They yeah. also prevented, uh, they, they also stopped very quickly getting overrun by major money laundering investments from China and, and the Middle East, which Canada mm -hmm. has not done. The U.S. has, but Canada has not done either. So we mm -hmm. have allowed that to go on, which has also contributed to the jamming up of real estate prices. Right on. I think another factor here, um, and you know this well, Diane, is is the whole existence of so many state-run enterprises in Canada, so-called crown corporations. And years ago, you know the history, uh, we privatized Air Canada, uh, Canadian National Railway. Uh, there's some of the best uh, enterprises now in the world, but you also have the privatization of the Canadian Wheat Board. I mean, those are great stories to celebrate. And at Frontier, we've done a lot of evaluation with one of our senior fellows, Ian Madsen. And surprise, surprise, he's found out that all these crown corporations are underperforming capital. Imagine that. They're not, they're not that productive. They don't pay taxes. Wouldn't that be a no-brainer to privatize those enterprises and uh, improve our productivity and have more people pay taxes and move our culture forward to be more entrepreneurial? Well, I think privatization is... Uh is not always a good thing and it's not always a bad thing. I think it has to be taken on a case by case. Sure. Yeah. Basis. But you know, Canada, uh, you've got to understand too, that, uh, these crown corporations are, uh, stock full of political appointees who answer to mm -hmm. the liberal party for the most part part. Uh, this is a federal government Trudeau and those type of people who are very much, uh, wed to the French model, and we know how well France has done, ha ha, uh, the mm -hmm. French model of statism and environmentalism. Right. And and that's and they're rigid on those things. They're not flexible. And the other problem is they don't, I don't think they they under they don't understand economics. They don't understand business. 
And uh, there's not a business person in that cabinet. So, you know, I, I think what you've got is a situation where you've got the underperforming. Now, one thing, um, you know, there, there are two, two, three sectors in Canada which really differentiate it from the U.S. economy that are enormously important, but I'm not sure you want to privatize. One is healthcare. Mm-hmm. We, you know, healthcare is public sector owned and run. Okay. And I think it performs much better than the U.S. model. Not think. I know it does statistically. Mm-hmm. It covers people. It, you know, it's it's a much superior model when it comes to healthcare because I think competition is a bad thing in healthcare. You can't have people, you know, fighting over what ambulance to tap. I mean, it's crazy. The, the U.S. proves that it. it's the worst healthcare system on the planet. Mm-hmm. So I think our healthcare system is is public sector should remain so. That's fine. Maybe a little bit of privatization here and here here and there at the edges, which now goes goes on. Uh, you've got the banking sector. Now that's a social contract in Canada that helped Canada avoid the Great Depression and and helped us avoid most of the effects of the Great Recession of 2008. And that is that the federal banks um, are chartered and licensed and adhere to whatever the finance minister in Ottawa says. Mm-hmm. Okay, or you know whatever whatever the central bank says. And so they function as sort of um, surrogate uh, deputy ministers of finance, each each chairman. Mm-hmm. They're all politicized, and most of them are liberals, and that's the way they run it. And they have a cozy little arrangement. They agreed to accede to the wishes of the federal government in return for which the federal government of the day said, we'll keep the American banks out of your country. So you can have your nice little log- oligopoly and gouge Canadian consumers because they're deferential and don't say anything, but we won't let the Americans in. And that's been the deal. On balance, mm-hmm. I would say they didn't get messed up in the turmoil. Mm-hmm. They had been, you know, freewheeling. And so that's okay. That doesn't bother me. I don't like the politicization. I don't like the fact that every ex mm-hmm. politician now works in a very important position in one of the banks. That should not be ever allowed. But uh, and then the other other sector, which is also I think um, something Canadians should be proud of, is the fact that there's only one province that hasn't got publicly owned uh, power utilities, Alberta. Okay. You look at Hydro Quebec, you look at Ontario Hydro, you look at BC and all the rest of them. These are very well run, gigantic and important Mm -hmm. economic generators for Mm -hmm. our country. Now, if they were privatized, I would imagine they would be three times bigger than they are now because the profits generated would have been gone gone down to the U.S. and picked up a lot of American small privately owned Mm. facilities. So you you sacrifice uh, when you, when you have something like that, and they're all they're controlled by the provinces. Mm-hmm. But when you have that that kind of political control, that statism, that's very much the French model. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of wiggle room. I my guess is that half the Canadian economy is public sector, and half is private. Mm. Although major airports around the world are private, with the exception of Canada, it's an interesting example where. Our airports um, arguably could be run much better, like they are in Australia. Well, I, I uh, Pearson is kind of a funny thing. It's private. It's not public. It's not private. I don't know what it mm-hmm. is. Anyway, it's a lousy airport. And you're right. I mean, you, I think you have to pick your spots. If you think that if there's a really imp- compelling case that privatization would uh, create jobs, fulfill the social you know benefit tests, and so on and so forth. And, and yield a uh, long-term advantage to the economy mm-hmm. and the society, then I think you privatize. But I don't think it's a given. So can you help us uh, put this whole war on Canadian oil and gas into perspective? It seems like uh, one of our ace cards in our country has been affordable energy, including affordable energy uh, from, from Canada, oil and gas. And it's been ethically produced. It's It's really quite in contrast with... Uh, nasty regimes like Venezuela and Saudi Arabia and all Russia. the rest. Uh, Russia is a good example. And yet our our Canadian pension plan, if uh, if I understood this correctly, used a screen, one of these environmental social governance screens, ESG screens, 
uh, and they chose Russian oil and gas to invest in our pension money rather than Canadian oil and gas. This is bizarre. How is this possible? Because it's run by the liberals. It's political. Whoever's there is running. Whoever's making those shots in the CPP has been, you know, nominated by the libs and, and has to uh, go along with whatever. So I, I don't know. It sounds crazy on surface. I don't know. Maybe there's a reason behind it. But I just don't think politics has any business in someone who's 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 empowered to invest my future pension money. OK, I don't like that. And, you know, that's that's the sort of thing. Case de Depot is nothing more than a, a an, an investment arm of the Quebec government. And they, they yeah. finance all kinds of stupid businesses in Quebec that don't make any money and they don't go outside. So they're they're tied to the mass should anything go wrong. I mean, this is just a silly way to run a, a run run an economy. It really is. So, it, it, it you know, it, it almost seems all these policies are kind of up in the clouds, in the green clouds as more of an ideology, but they're not really grounded on the reality of running an enterprise. I think that's a big part of your point, isn't it, Diane? You know, I mean, it's and this whole, you know, hypocrisy about, uh, you know, oh, oil and gas from Western Canada, bad. Mm -hmm. power from Quebec, good. Yeah. Well, right. since when is is ruining an area the size of Western Europe to build dams and concrete reservoirs mm -hmm. and aqueducts in Quebec good for the environment? Mm -hmm. By the way, the transmission lines are not good for the environment because, and the Americans, uh, you know, nixed uh, Quebec Hydro's uh, uh, initiative recently to build transmission lines to take its clean energy down to Boston and New York. Well, people don't want that litter, uh, you know, all across their farmlands and those wires and nobody knows mm -hmm. what that, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it, 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 we don't play team sports here. Yeah, exactly. So I did want to shift a little bit more to the international side because you certainly um, uh, have a lot of incisive analysis about that. I do want to talk a little bit about China and the uh, Communist Party of China. There's been a lot of, um, how do we say, uh, huge red flags about the Chinese Communist Party and its involvement in our domestic political scene. It's really quite remarkable, the uh, indicators of... of uh, interference in um, the last several uh, federal elections in favor, of the, in favor of the liberals indeed yes so do we need a public inquiry what's the big hold up what what's going on here that's the problem it's a deferential population and a mediocre unethical government in place right now mm -hmm. yes we should have had a public commission but i think there was a bit of one they he he appointed his old buddy uh, David Johnston, uh, right. you know, who who did a, a remarkably awful job and said, there's no problem. Just take my word for it. And besides, we mm -hmm. can't talk about it because it's secret. You know, what kind of a cop out is that? Uh, yeah. You know, you have judicial inquiries and you keep it closeted and you, mm -hmm. you get it out and you understand it. But, you know, again, the, the, the little the twins in Ottawa get what they want. And they certainly don't want uh, anything like that to to scar them. And, you know, it's just there's just no. And imagine, look at all the upheaval in the U.S. I'm not saying it's a good thing. Look at the mm -hmm. upheaval in the U.S. over voter counts. Good mm -hmm. Lord. Claims it was stolen from me and litigation. And I mean, it, it goes on endlessly. And there's not even, you know, any kind of protests or anything over the fact that it has been admitted mm -hmm. that 16 or 17 writings were stolen by the liberals with the help of Chinese in people. Yeah, in it's life. outrageous. And yeah. that cost Aaron O'Toole the prime minister's job mm -hmm. because that wasn't the only interference. Yeah. So to think that, you know, a good chunk of the pop, and he got a greater percentage of the popular vote than, than Trudeau did and mm -hmm. lost. And then this sabotage, I mean, and to do nothing about it and people aren't up in arms. Well, you get the government you deserve. Well, and I think you're, you're, you're putting your finger on something. We have a wonderful Canadian culture, but boy, there's a side to it that seems to be kind of passive 
and not engage with getting better government. It's almost like we assume the government, uh, we should trust them completely and just kind of uh, disengage. Is that a fair comment? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why. Um, the other game that's afoot that the Liberals have perpetuated very, very, uh, very well is the the old uh, rule that, uh, oh, you want the Conservatives? You want to have an America here? Do you want to yeah, be right. in America? Yes. You know, Diane Francis, she was born mm-hmm. in America. She's probably right. a, a, a Republican. Democrat, by the way. A Canadian conservative is left of the Democrats in the U.S., by the way. No, I'm not. I'm not. And and Pierre Poilievre, oh, no, he's right wing. Well, that's scary. He took coffee to the convoy. Ooh, wow. MAGA. Wow. <laughs> We're going to get MAGA. And the guys <laughs> at every possible prep opportunity stoke that. They stoke that you know Aaron O'Toole mentioned gun control and that was blown up out of proportion and then also right. he control the CBC mm-hmm. which should be shut down and mm-hmm. and you know most of the you know press is liberal the Globe and Mail the Toronto Star they're all sellouts to the liberals so right. you know the Canadians aren't getting the good good information um and you know life's okay okay so Diane on that point I find it interesting because um my family as well as yours i mean we're both canadians and americans but you are dual citizenship is that correct yes i am so in that context you have kind of a unique perspective on this as well and it's it's a funny level of i i would say peeling the onions around um i don't know canadian culture in, in the sense that i think there's many canadians that seem to think they know American culture, when in fact they don't. Yeah. There's the danger that just because of proximity, we think we know the Americans when we may not know them. Not in all case. fairness, it's complex. Even states vary differently in terms of their culture. And then you have the other dynamic where our Canadians. It's funny. We're very proud people. Uh, we have a lovely country. It's incredible. And sometimes we're. Um, are we insecure when it comes to being close to the United States? I mean, a lot of countries are uh, when compared to the United States. I mean, it's pretty humbling stuff, isn't it? Well, yes and no. I mean, you know, my children are Canadian. They're very proud of it. You know, uh, they never took mm-hmm. out American citizenship because of, there's a tax mm-hmm. issue anyway when you right. hold people, but they have no interest in living there. Uh, they, they, love, they love the country. Um, you know, that's another thing that really annoys me about Trudeau. And and about Singh is their bad mouthing of Canada as as a culture and as a people. You know, we're racist. Yes. I don't think we're more racist than mm-hmm. I don't think we're as racist as most other G seven countries. Right. Uh, are we and and he once made a statement which he never explained, but I think you can understand it in light of the policies that he's imposed on Canadians, is that this is this is the first the world's first non state nation. Yeah, what does that mean? It means you do everything the globalists want you to do. Okay, the Davos agenda again. Greta Thunberg, Davos, you know, mm-hmm. Greenpeace. I mean, he had the president of Greenpeace run his campaign for him, Gerald Butts, and his energy mm-hmm. minister now was a big shot in Greenpeace, Stephen mm-hmm. Gubot. I mean, you know, this is just handing over to ideologues haven't been voted as to whether that is why they were voted for or should be there. Uh, and they're damaging things to our country. Yeah. And I, I like the, the, the point that we have to be very guarded about our story as a country and our identity. I mean, Canada is an incredible nation. It's got incredible prosperity that we could lose if we don't nurture those values that allow for not just um, a civility, and ability to have healthy debate, but also all those things, like including freedom of speech, are, are foundational for prosperity, aren't they, Diane? Yeah, I mean, we have we have all of the all of the elements of continuing to be to take our place as an important, you know, influential uh, nation state, uh, except that we have a very mediocre federal government and have done since 2015. Uh, I think our premiers, a lot of them are home runs. I'm very impressed with the premiers. They're they're usually businessmen. Gee whiz, isn't mm-hmm. that interesting? 
you know, if you're going to be a CEO of a province, you should be a business person. Uh, and, and so, you know, this sort of posturing at this sort of, you know, rarefied liberal Davos, Greta mm-hmm. Thunberg thing uh, up there is just not helpful and it's not appropriate. And, and Canadians are pretty much disconnected from it. And he's starting to fall in the polls because I began a crusade of pointing out to people, this is not a million immigrants. This is a million health cards a year that are being given out and a million apartment houses that are pushing up the cost of everything. Yeah. So when you look to provinces, what would be some of the stars that you look to uh, that, that uh, you think are doing well? Well, I, you know, well, BC is a, a write-off because it's run by the Greens. I mean, it's a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a missed opportunity, and that has been for years. It's a crazy province. I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Doug Ford is fine. I think Saskatchewan and Alberta do a good job, whoever's in place, because they have a very economically astute voting electorate Mm -hmm. and who have their heads in the right, you know, heads on. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and so that's good. Um, I was very impressed. And he was rather outspoken with the premier of New Brunswick uh, about the energy mythology. And he took Trudeau head on after he lost an LNG plant that the Spanish wanted to build when our, you know, moronic prime minister told told Germany and Japan, oh, there's no future for LNG here. There's no business model. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's absurd. So we, why would we, we why would we forfeit that opportunity? One LNG project underway and it's at triple the cost because of federal government interference and nonsense in BC. Mm-hmm. We could have had uh, an enormous, uh, we could have paid an enormous contribution to Europe in helping it get off Russian uh, fossil fuels and Middle Eastern too, that's not much better. And and we have done none of that. We we could have helped China get, get off coal burning by having mm-hmm. LNG on our West Coast for them. We did none of that. And so, you know, he went around and he said there was no business case by comparison in, in since 2015, the Americans have built, I think, 180 LNG plants, and they are the biggest LNG exporter trader on the planet, overtaking Qatar, Australia, and Norway. When you, when you, have, a country, you have a country that's run by people, when you have a country whose economy is run by people that understand economics, mm-hmm. that's the difference. Exactly. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've left a huge opportunity uh, on the table and that's only hurt Canadians. And I would argue the environment as uh, as China brings on stream more and more uh, coal fired uh, facilities every month. Yeah. I mean, as the premier of New Brunswick said to me, everybody knows that natural gas is the transition fuel. Exactly. Yes. You have to have a transition fuel that you can count on as a base load when you're going to renewables because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. Exactly. And the other thing is, you know, uh, we should be building more nuclear. Now it, it's what's also interesting though, is people don't realize, and of course Trudeau would never go around internationally and bragging about it, but the greenest grid in the world is Ontario has the greenest grid, nuclear, hydro renewables, unbelievable. I do. Yeah. Well, I would argue that that really much of the energy uh, profile in Canada is uh, extraordinarily diversified and ethical already. And so to, to talk about the so-called green transition is is really not grounded in any reality of understanding of our current energy supplies. He fixes on metrics that activists give him to spout. Yeah, that's exactly. all he does. He never yeah, thinks so much. The man, I just, I don't know what he does. Apparently he reads science fiction books all the time. Okay, well, go figure. So speaking of the international scene, uh, Diane, you know that, um, what was it, on August the 22nd, we had the uh, 15th summit in South Africa uh, with the so-called BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and of course, South Africa. Yes, of course. Uh, (laughs) And that's why they had the summit in South Africa for their 15th time. So in that case, we know that, um, well, is it over half the trading in the world is hinged on the uh, the U.S. dollar, the so-called reserve currency of the world. Um, 
So do you think the creation of a BRICS currency is inevitable? No, they'll fight over whose currency is the, is the BRICS currency. You know, China wants to do what it wants to do. Russia actually thinks it's still a country. It's actually an organized criminal or it's a criminal organization. Yeah, exactly. you know? right. uh, but, you know, they would argue, oh, the ruble is important. You know, this is nonsense. Uh, the dollarization uh, it is resented, but the dollarization is not anything that was imposed on anybody. Look, mm -hmm. what the Americans do, and it's messy when you see debt ceiling debates in Congress and so on and debates, but they actually police the, uh, the supply demand mm -hmm. of their currency to protect right. its value. Mm -hmm. They have the Federal Reserve System, which is the strongest, best in the world. They have a Congress, which has a debt ceiling requirement which keeps the lid on it. So you don't get somebody like you do in a banana republic, just, you know, running the printing presses. And, and this is, the, so it's, it's a bona fide value and it has very deep capital markets to place this. Exactly, value. yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a currency that, that even the shopkeeper in Nigeria in the corner will accept because mm -hmm. it's trustworthy. So to think that I'm going to accept Chinese Canadian tire money or South African Canadian tire money mm -hmm. instead of good old US dollars, you, they're crazy. And, and it's, also bad. it's a strong country with, with very strong economic parameters that govern how much they print and when. And mm -hmm. also they have these deep capital markets and it's very important and they have gold and they also have um, a very strong military. If you don't have a strong military, you can't be a currency that anybody would trust in. You get taken over by somebody who just prints it. I mean, this is these are the basic fundamental differences that are never discussed. It's not a matter of, oh, your coat is prettier than mine. No, their mm -hmm. coat is actually warm right. and works. Yours yeah. doesn't. That's the Well, difference. and I think the other point, and it's a good analysis, Diane, is that behind that as well on the reserve currency is culture. And you've alluded to it earlier, is that it, it is truly extraordinary, the, the level of entrepreneurship um, that, that attracts capital uh, to the United States. And that's, that's foundational to that reserve currency concept. 100% and their trading uh, profile is huge. Mm -hmm. And yeah. let's remember, this is the country that, in, that has invented the 21st century in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. Right, Nobody else exactly. Did. Nobody else did. So, if we look back at Canada, and, and uh, we're kind of coming to the end of our, our our very interesting discussion, Dan. If we look at Canada, I mean, it's an incredible country, as we as we've talked about. Um, we build on a long tradition of of uh, economic success and freedom. Um, how do we get it back on track? How do we um, improve our culture, our our sense of our history, uh, let alone our economy? Well, you know, we do have, uh, I think uh, culture is a problem. Uh, Trudeau would argue that anything to do with the British culture was bad. Mm -hmm. I would argue that anything to do with French culture is bad. Mm -hmm. So you have that division that, that the British never, never could fix. And what they did was they gave inordinate power to Quebec to keep them happy and happy and prevent them from leaving. And that mm -hmm. has been sustained. So the result of that is, I kind of look at it this way, Canada has the same problem, only different than the United States. These are both countries that were founded two centuries ago, have bylaws that are out of date, okay, that can never be changed because constitutions are unassailable. And the problem in the United States is they had 12 or 14 Southern states that seceded and should have been left to go. Hmm. Both Southern states are the crucible for all of the ultra right wing racist nonsense, MAGA stuff in that country. And they keep electing the same guys in Congress. So what I'm saying is that the Southern tail wags the American dog. Hmm. The majority of Americans are like the majority of Canadians, you know, mm -hmm. kind of economic conservative, but social liberal. <laughs> Canada has the same exact problem. We have the tail is Quebec, 
statist, environmentalist, left wing, give away the store, you know, resent everybody else, feel superior. And that's the tail that wags the Canadian dog. So the hmm. Canadian dog is wagged by a left wing tail and the American dog is, 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 is run by a right wing tail. Hmm. And that's really hard to, to, that it's going to be impossible to ever reconcile unless there's secession and nobody wants to do that. It's too mm -hmm. hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically you just have to hope that there's enough shock absorbers and that, you know, enlightened people, people that are qualified to run these, these countries are elected. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you anticipate a new, let's say federal government coming into power, is there a series of top recommendations for policy action that you'd recommend? Well, there's a little, well, first of all, you got to stop this, this flood of immigration. It's nuts. You have to clean up the student visa thing, which is filled with fraud. Mm -hmm. Filled with this, pri there's, there's organizations in Brampton, Ontario that call themselves private schools that get a little charter and stuff. They're fake. Mm -hmm. And they help get visas for a fee to gangsters in India. I mean, this is known. The crime rate in Brampton is worse than Chicago. So, I mean, this is this is the kind of mismanagement uh, mm -hmm. that's got to be cracked down on. So, immigration has got to be uh, reined in and reinvented so that it does benefit Canadians. And then, you of course, have to take in a certain number of people for humanitarian purposes. That's separate mm -hmm. from immigration. Right. Uh, I think the military is embarrassing. I don't think that, uh, and, and if we want to be listened around the table and, you know, we're get, we're losing ground because of these people, uh, you know, we're, we're now, we're going to be overtaken in a year by South Korea as the 10th biggest economy. South Korea right. should be in the G7, not Canada. Right. Canada's falling off the ranking in just mm -hmm. about every metric. And so that should be reversed somehow, wherever it's possible. Well said. So if, if you were to turn to Canadians as citizens in terms of recommendations for action, Diane, are there things that you'd encourage us to do other than to speak up to our representative and give them a call and say, hey, look, this uh, level of immigration is not serving Canadians, as an example. What would you recommend citizens do? Well, I mean, getting more involved would be, would be refreshing because mm -hmm. they don't get more involved. I think that people have to uh, really be more economically literate. I think they have to understand that when he comes out with one of these stupid environmental requirements or carbon tax that does nothing to reduce emissions, that it only damages our reputation, our foreign investment inflow, and our economy and jobs. And, you know, people have to say, well, wait a minute, what about that? I don't think that, is that really a good idea? So, so they're very, you know, very docile, and so that has to stop. Uh, the other thing is the Canadians are very polite and, you know, they don't want to be seen. And, you know, big shaming. There's a society that shames. You know, if you say something about immigration, right away somebody says she's a racist or he's a racist. Mm -hmm. That's why my crusade about immigration has zeroed in on the fact that it's a million health cards a year, not a million people. And it's a million apartments or houses a year. That's it. And they're ruining our society. And that's got to stop. The numbers don't make sense. And we're not feeling, you know, the need uh, that industry keeps talking about is, is uh, worker skills, skilled trades workers. We're not really getting them. So, you know, I, Canadians are always loath to talk about immigration. The I word, ooh, you know, oh, dear, I'm a bad person, right? And Mr. Singh is up there you know, pontificating to all of us that, you know, we are bad, bad people who have, you know, hurt and been racist. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, it, it's wow. really, it's it, Canadians have to be tougher minded. And mm -hmm. I think Poilievre is doing a good job. He's trying, it's an uphill climb. Uh, but, you know, I think that we may get a Tory government. Mm -hmm. that, that's my hope. Well, it, it's, uh, I want to thank you so much, Diane, for our conversation today and really challenging us to think as adults about the kind of major challenges and issues that we face, as well as being proud Canadians. And uh, so thank you so much for your work as a columnist around the world and as a uh, best-selling author. So thank you so much for joining us today. 
You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.